you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and most gracious Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us steadfast in your grace and truth. Protect and deliver us in times of temptation. Defend us against all enemies. And grant to your church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The first reading for Reformation Day is from the Revelation to St. John, the 14th chapter. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from Romans, the third chapter. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. 
For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. This is the word of the Lord.
Gospel according to St. John, the eighth chapter. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Amen. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. You may be seated. In the name of Jesus, amen. Dear Harrison and all the baptized, I want to begin today by meditating and thinking carefully about the law of God and what the law is, what the law does, and what the law means. 
We have a God who speaks, and His speaking to us is first instruction or commands. In other words, law. He tells us what to do and what not to do. The first question that we need to ask is, do we do it? Do we keep the law? Do we keep God's commands? Now, you all are shaking. I can see some of you shaking your head no, but that's because you come to church. (laughs) Just think of our natural reason, how it answers that question. I'm not sure it says yes. I'm not sure it says no either. It's kind of a soft no. Not really, but nobody's perfect. I try to do my best, but I probably fail. But this fact at last becomes apparent to us as we reflect on what God requires and what we do and don't do, that all of us are, in fact, lawbreakers. All have sinned, this is how Paul says it, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God from the beginning when Adam and Eve were in the garden and forbidden from eating the tree, from the tree that was in the middle of the garden until now, all of us have sinned, that means we've broken God's law, and that means we're guilty. In fact, our guilt is so bad that we confess that because of it we deserve God's anger, His wrath, and His punishment. We don't keep the law. But there's another question that really needs some consideration, and it is this, can we keep the law? Now, our reason, our sinful flesh, and really every moral philosophy and every religion says, yes, we can. We might need some help. We might need some training. We might need the grace of God or the infusion of the Holy Spirit. But surely we must be able to keep the law. After all, why would God give a command that couldn't be kept? And if we couldn't keep the law, if we said, no, you can't keep the law, then how in the world could you be guilty for not doing something that you couldn't do in the first place? If you could imagine it this way, can you imagine if you were walking the dog in your neighborhood and you came across a home where the father and the son were out in the front yard playing basketball And the dad handed his son the basketball, and he says, dunk it. Now, this is curious because the boy is 12 years old and four feet tall. (laughs) There's not a chance. So you pause to watch. Dunk the basketball. Right now, dunk it. And the father is serious. He goes on, not only, ju- not, not only to give a command that is absolutely impossible, he adds threats to that command. He says, if you don't dunk the basketball, and if you don't dunk it right now, then you're going straight to bed without dinner. What would you think of such a man? What would you think about that conversation? How dare he? How, how dare he give a command that can't be kept? And how dare he threaten to punish Punish this child for not keeping an impossible command. So our sinful flesh brings this logic to the law of God. In fact, it was a big part of the Reformation. You remember, uh, remember Erasmus? He was one of the big guys that Luther was fighting against. Erasmus published a famous essay on the freedom of the will, and he makes that same argument. Only an unjust God would give commands that cannot be kept. Only an unrighteous God would threaten to punish people for something that they couldn't do in the first place. So it must be, Erasmus argued, it must be that we we are able to keep the law of God by our own free will. Now this has results, theological results. Because if it's true that I don't keep the law, but I could keep the law, then not only can I keep the law, but I should keep the law, and more than that, I must keep the law. I must do something in obedience to the Lord in order to be good enough to be saved. 
So just about every error in the Christian church comes down to this, that we have a part in our salvation. How could it be any other, anything otherwise? How could God be righteous if he punishes us for not keeping commands that we can't possibly keep? Well, Luther and the Lutherans come into the argument and they, they, they have something to add. They say this. They say, now, hold on. Before we get too carried away about our ability to keep the law, let's pay close attention to the Scriptures. And it seems to us, when we read the Scriptures and what the Scriptures say about the law of God, they say something quite different. In fact, the Scriptures teach us that the most important function and use of the law is not to guide us on the way to righteousness, but rather to expose our sin, to show forth our sinful nature. This is how Paul said it in the epistle lesson He says, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth will be stopped and the whole world would be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. It it turns out that our sinfulness is not so obvious as it would appear. Remember the first question, do I keep God's law? We have a soft no, but that no is too soft. We think that we at least have a chance at keeping it, that sometimes we keep it, that we're really not that bad. This is why the early church used the picture of leprosy to describe our sinful nature. Remember one of the problems with leprosy is not only does it corrupt your skin, but it corrupts your nerves so that you can't feel if you're wounded or harmed. If you, if you have leprosy in your leg, you can't feel it. If someone stomps on your toe or in your hand, you can't feel it if you cut your hand. And so, and so you've lost the ability to know how badly you're injured. The, the picture, remember, it, that we use is, to, is the difference between someone who falls off a ladder and breaks their leg and someone who falls off a ladder and breaks their leg and their neck. If you come across someone with a broken leg, you, you say, how are you? And he says, not good. <laughs> I've broken my leg. I need help. But if you come across someone who's broken their leg and their neck and you ask them, how are you doing? They say, I don't know. I can't feel my legs. And this is how, how badly we were damaged in the fall so that we don't even recognize how badly we're wounded, how deep the corruption is, how much of a sinner we are. And so the law comes along to show us our own sin. Remember the the dad playing basketball with his son? Here's the full story. If you would just rewind the clock 30 minutes earlier and you could be sitting at the dinner table with them, you would have heard this little pipsqueak of a son bragging about how good he was at basketball. In fact, in fact, he said to his mom and his dad, his brothers and sisters, he says, I'm the greatest basketball player that ever lived. He says, I can win the slam dunk contest right now. I could beat a whole NBA team by myself single-handedly, and I don't need you, mom and dad. I don't need dinner. In fact, I don't need to eat this Brussels sprouts (laughs) because I'm the greatest basketball player ever to live. And now the father takes him out in the front yard and gives him the ball and says, dunk it. You see? You see? The command to do something impossible shows our own weakness, our own failure, our own sin, our own guilt. It silences our boasting mouth before the throne of God. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped. So that we would know that not only have we broken God's law, not only have we not done what the law commanded, but that we can't do what the law commands. Which means that you cannot save yourself. You cannot add to your salvation. You cannot 
help your way on the way to salvation. You cannot start your salvation, finish your salvation, or do anything at all to add to it. That is the stopped mouth that the law brings about. But if that's the case, then what are we to do? If we can't save ourselves or add to our own salvation, if we can't somehow make God pleasing with us by our works and our efforts or help along the way, what are we to do? Dear saints, this is the whole point. There's nothing to do. Jesus is the Savior. He is the one who does the work. He is the one who accomplishes salvation. And our salvation is found not in ourselves, but in Him and in Him alone. Christ alone is good. Christ alone is holy. Christ alone is righteous. Christ alone is perfect. But in his death and in his resurrection, he brings that perfection and that holiness and that righteousness and gives it to you in your baptism, Harrison. It's given to you in your baptism, dear saints. It's given to you. All your sins are washed away and you are accepted by God. But I haven't done anything. Right. <laughs> He has done it all. <laughs> and he's done it all out of grace, all out of mercy. Jesus loves you. And we sit there in our sin and say, why? Why would he possibly love me? And the answer is, I've got no idea. <laughs> but he does. He loves you. He loves me. He died for us so that he would be the Savior. So let us rejoice that the law brings this knowledge of sin so that, so that all this business of, of keeping the law and, and making God happy with us and somehow being pleased with us, that all of that is thrown in the trash. And we put all of our eggs in one basket, all of our faith in one man, all of our trust in one promise. Christ died for sinners. Christ died for you. May God grant to us this comfort and this peace. In the name of Jesus, amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. for the renewal of the church in this and every age. In thanksgiving for Martin Luther and those who contended for the gospel against many and great enemies, and that God would also make us bold to contend for the faith against those who would silence our voices or distract his people from the one true gospel of the crucified and risen Christ, let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. For the whole Christian church, throughout the world, and for all who confess Christ, that God would guard and defend us from the temptation of the devil, the world, and our own sinful nature. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our homes and for our families, that God would keep us in his word and so make us true his, truly his disciples, freed from error and at peace, and especially for all fathers, that God would preserve and encourage them for their godly task to bring up children who fear him. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord for our nation, that its rulers would be good and faithful, governing after God's good pleasure, and for its citizens, that having a right understanding of God's rules in this world, they would not be deceived to think earthly powers would last forever, but have confidence in him alone. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all people in need, that they would not fear though the earth gives way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, and that they would trust in God and be comforted by his promise to be with them always. Let us pray to the Lord. 
for thanksgiving, of God providing the shepherds for the fields, for sending Pastor Knuckles to this flock in Greenfield, Wisconsin. Bless his words. Bless his administration of the sacraments in that place. Enable that flock to hear and to be at peace with the gifts that God gives. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord, also for the gift that you provide in the water and the word of holy baptism. We thank you for the gift that you've given to Harrison to add him to your family. The forgiving of his sins, the strengthening of his faith, and the gift of eternal life. Lord, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, For all who approach Christ's table, that God would give us faithful and repentant hearts by his spirit to receive worthily Christ's body and blood and to bear fruit in lives of holiness and humble service. And that God would bless his church through the forgiveness of sins. That having a clear conscience before him, we may live at peace with one another. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have brought us by your word out of the darkness of error and into the light of your grace. Mercifully help us to walk in that light. Guard us from error and false doctrine and grant that we would not become ungrateful and despise your word, but receive it with all our heart, conduct our lives according to it, and put our trust in your grace. Through the merits of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift His countenance upon you and grant you peace. Peace.